You know, I believe we can change the story from one of cynicism, destructiveness, and irresponsibility, not by saying don't think of an elephant or don't be bad or don't do that, but to suggest there's other ways of, of being and, of, and behaving and structures you can build around uh, ideas, big ideas like hope, like fairness, like responsibility. This is the one I want to show you today. Another uh, two big ideas, one from the East Coast and one from the West, based on different kind of mental models that I believe when you push the good stuff in, the crap comes out the other side, we have a chance. Out with the old and with the new. And here's the first one. We need a mental model. We need a set of values and interrelated belief systems um, that can build a, a, a food system based on uh, a, shared, a shared common good. Um, this is a vision that came out of the New England state. Anybody ever heard of the New England food vision? How you, Jack, where did you hear about that? You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is six New England states that have suggested that we need to, their slogan is 50 by 60. In New England, there's a commitment among six New England states and the participants that 50% of our food in New England, produced in New England by 2060. 50 by 60 is 50% 50 by 2060. Imagine the Hudson River didn't have any bridges. If the Hudson River didn't have any bridges, we would be almost an island. If you stop rolling the trucks and bringing the ships into port, we have three days worth of food on the shelf. That's not a very resilient system. It's not a system that's, that's designed to <laughs> respond to difficulties. Uh, if, the, if the bridges on the Hudson River were gone, we would be hungry in three days. If close the airports and close the seaports. Um, we believe that at least 50% of our food can be grown in, in England, in, in New England, uh, and create a more vibrant food economy. The authors of this, this came from um, Brian Donahue was a professor at uh, Brandeis. Brandeis. Uh, he now lives up in Northfield, and he started his own little sustainable farm. But he wrote, uh, he did a study with a number of academics from Eastern Massachusetts on the New England food system, and suggested that the rates of in food insecurity have escalated in the six New England states over the last 20, 50, 20, 20 to 30, 40 years. Food insecurity is a sense of you don't really know where your next where your next meal is coming from. It's not. Poverty, it's not out and out hunger. It's a sense that we really don't have a sense of that where our food's coming from. Food insecurity is documentedly rising in New England. Dietary patterns are contributing to illness, uh, heart disease, lung disease, um, you know, diabetes. The way we eat, the things that we eat are contributing to uh, a public health crisis. And the land ownership in the food sector, people of color and minorities are excluded for the, large, for the, large, for the most part from the New England food system. And they've suggested that these three attributes of the system suggest it's not working as well as it could. Rather than trashing the food system, we say, well, you know what? We produce a lot of food. It's relatively cheap for most people. Uh, but we have some problems. We can do better. We can do better by addressing the food insecurity of, the many, of many people, um, by looking at the kind of foods we eat and to make sure that the diversity of social interest in, in the food system as well as um, a diversity of products. The New England, print, the New England uh, food system was based on two principles. One, that food is a powerful determinant. We can actually change the world by changing how we think about food. Food is so much part of our lives and so much part of our culture that food is a leverage point for changing culture. Second thing is New Englanders can pursue a future in which food systems benefit all. There's a belief here that suggests it does not have to be exploited, exploitative. Uh, it can benefit all. That's an assumption. I don't know if it's true, but it's an assumption upon which this says this this proposal is based. 50 by 60, 50% 50 regional food by 2060. The assumptions are in making this, uh, this, this proposal is that first of all, we will begin to choose healthy foods. And the way they describe healthy foods is not necessarily you know, vegan or vegetarian. It's simply using the food pyramid or the food, the food plate of the USDA. Simply by using the food suggestion of the USDA, which is not terribly radical, folks, you know. It's reducing your meat consumption, eating more greens, eating more, you know, bean, uh, uh, legume-based uh, uh, proteins. Uh, we would, uh, we need to do that. If we can't do that, then this proposal doesn't work. We have to change our diets. Energy costs will continue to rise, but we will make an effort to reduce our carbon footprint. There's still going to be transportation, but if you can provide uh, more product locally, we can reduce our carbon footprint and not have so much stored and, and, and uh, and frozen foods. We will choose to protect 70% of the current wild lands and woodlands in New England. There was a time in southern New England where there weren't any trees left. 
If you go up in the Mohawk Trail, prior to about 1830, there was a small stand of trees in the steepest, steepest slope, and the rest of western Massachusetts was grazed for sheep. There were no trees. Um, today, we're, after the Civil War and people moved to the to Midwest, um, trees came back. We've got forests, and Brian Donahue and his friends believe that's an important part of our culture, that we can't go back to eliminating the trees. Uh, but that we can protect 70% of the wildlands, the wetlands, uh, the river systems, and the woodlands, and still produce a lot more of our food. But we would need to decide to have more integrated farms. These are farms like you've, you've studied in sustainable agriculture class, like Simple Gifts, that has a, uh, a vegetable culture and, a, and an animal culture, so you can cycle nutrients, you know? The three principles of um, ecological being are one is power needs to be solar power, and preferably that solar power needs to be fresh solar power, <laughs> from the sun or in trees, not ancient solar power that's currently stored in the ground as coal. All power needs to be solar power. And you know, the, the movement of rivers is solar power, the movement of wind is solar powered, but that's where we need to get our energy from. The second uh, attribute of an ecologically sustainable system is that everything material cycles. The bumper sticker version of that is waste equals food. Waste equals food is an ecological principle. There's only two things in the universe, energy and matter. Energy must be solar and energy must be cycled. But to make that happen, you have to have biologically diverse systems. Simple systems, 1,000 acres of corn, will not achieve those two first, those first two functions. And so biological diversity, including integrated farming systems, the crops and livestock, is necessary for this vision to, be, to occur. Now, I don't know if we can achieve, achieve all these. I don't know if we're willing to change our diet. I don't know if we're willing to curb our energy costs. I think we're probably willing to, to protect our woodlands and wildlands. Well, I'm not sure if we're going to be ready to support integrated farms because big uh, livestock CAFOs and hog facilities in the Carolinas and the West are cheaper. They produce a cheaper, cheap, a lower priced product, but a more costly product environmentally and socially. Those are assumptions that, the, that uh, were set up as the, as the uh, prerequisites for this vision. And then, if we could do this, we can expand farmland in New England by threefold, about well, 15% of farmland in New England. Some of it's on the river bottoms producing vegetables, some of it on the, on the hills uh, producing uh, uh, sheep and goats and cows, beef cows. Bringing up our, current, our, um, our farmland up to about six million acres from the current about two million acres in New England. Uh, that's the same as 1945, folks. You know, this is not going back to the 1830s. This is something that right after World War II, we had about 15% of New England in food, in, in food, food production. If we could do that, we could grow most of our vegetables, half of our fruits and juices, most of our dry beans, and all of our dairy, most of our beef and lamb and grass in the, uh, in the hillsides. This is a possibility um, for New England. It's a vision to suggest, you know what, we could do this. What we need to do is choose healthy diets, curb our energy consumption, and decide to have more integrated farms, not monoculture farms. But that's a possibility. This is a possibility. This, is, this is suggests we import about 50% of our fruits and juices uh, most of our grain, feed grain, um, to feed the livestock because it doesn't make a lot of sense to grow um, uh, grain, which can be shipped um, by train relatively cheaply and can be stored. It doesn't make sense to, to, to grow a lot of grain in New England when it's not really the kind of environment for grain. We have some um, um, commercial uh, uh, wheat, local wheat, and, and there are scientists trying to develop, redevelop wheat, wheat varieties for New England. So I think that's really cool, but that's for a local bread product. That's not to feed to the chickens. We can bring product from the Midwest. We're going to be grown in the West. We can grow a lot more cheaply and ship relatively um, energy efficiently um, to bring grain and vegetable oil from places where, they're, where they're, uh, they can be grown better. You've got to bring your peanuts, coffee, tea, chocolate, and sugar because we're not going to be without those things. So we've got to ship some things. This is not a radical vision, extremely radical vision, uh, it is a substantive change, however, that these people are proposing. But the key assumptions are we change our diet and we support integrated farms. If we're going to support monoculture farms, this doesn't work. If we're going to continue to eat a factory farm beef and chicken and pork, this is not going to work. But what they propose is a vision that goes way beyond food. It's about democratic empowerment of people. This is a movement, this is a, a suggestion, this has been... Many, many people have participated in creating this vision uh, from all walks of life and, and a huge social diversity of folks that have participated. But this is about economic sustainability. This is about uh, de democratic empowerment. This is about new leaders emerging, young people emerging. In New England, the fastest growing demographic, according to the last USDA census, was women-owned farms. Women-owned farms are the fastest growing 
farm category in New England. Um, that suggests that things can change. There's new leadership on the horizon. You can see it in our own major uh, of, of uh, the, the, the diversity of folks that come to our major. This vision suggests by 2060, we can grow 50% of our food, 50% of our land, land area in food. Changes in food production, distribution, and consumption are all possible. These are new structures. And I want to show you some examples of what those structures might look like conceptually. And then I'll give you a few examples of how they're beginning to emerge in the landscape. But we're going to change the vision and we're going to change the, the structures so that the food system begins to shift our cultural awareness and our, our, our awareness of um, our relative um, rela our re relationships with other people and with the land. The economic, socio-economic implications of this proposal, um, more food viability, more of a regional economic food viability, you know? Uh, more stuff, more production, more markets, a more vibrant local economy. Requires livable wages for all. We can't continue to exploit people who are, um, uh, who don't have opportunities uh, to go to college, for example. It's, it's uh, part of a sustainable system needs to, needs to embrace social equity and social justice if it's going to last. Uh, closer connection from producer to consumer. So we know where our food's coming from. We know the people and the families that are producing our food. Enhance access to land and equitable capital. I'll show you a proposal for that. Um, but we've got to provide access to people who no longer, who don't have access today. It's almost impossible to buy land in the Pioneer Valley because it's too expensive. But you can get access to land through conservation commissions. You can rent it from local towns and villages. Um, th there is land available in northern New England at a less, uh, lesser price, but there are really creative ways to provide land. The North Amherst Community Farm, which I'll tell you about in a minute, the, the home of simple gifts, is one way to recognize that land values are high in this region, and yet we still want farms. Uh, we need to provide access to land and capital. And that dignity is important, that access to food is for all. Well, the, the, uh, real, the uh, Food Solutions in New England have, on several occasions, um, created a racial equity challenge of suggesting how is it that we live in a world and to look at our privileges um, and, our, and our challenges um, through the eyes of, of racial minorities um, who created that program. This is a big idea. This is a shift in mental models that if, in, if embraced, will begin to shift structures. I'd ask you to have a look at the New England Food Vision and some of the outcome of that, some of the structures that have come from that have been proposed in the Massachusetts Food Policy Council. Anybody here of the Massachusetts Food Policy Council? Anybody takes Catherine Sands course? Has she talked about the Food Policy Council? She's very active in this. It's a, so look up Massachusetts Food Policy Council. You want to know where the action is and create new structures for, to, to achieve these goals? It happens at the Massachusetts Food Policy Council that Catherine Sands is very much part of. And, and there's a series of, I don't know what it is, 20 pages of recommendations, the committees that might address them, and, and recommendations of how to shift uh, these structures. So farming action 2.2.3, establish a state livestock care and standards board so that we don't abuse livestock. Each one of these recommendations comes out of a, a different vision, a vision of sustainability and wholeness. So, and that policy council is not an implementation council. It's a group of people that, have, that come from all over the state, appointed by the governor, to suggest how we're going to be creatively think about the food system of the future. This is happening in New England today. If you want to learn more about that, it's food solutions NE for New England org. And I think what they have proposed is a fairly exciting um, idea with some, with some legs. We've got to shift mental models. We've got to shift vision. And we've got to believe that this is possible. The second visionary document, the visionary proposal I want to share with you is called the Food Commons. This comes from the West Coast. Uh, Larry Yee uh, used to work for the University of California, uh, an old friend of mine um, who suggested, in California particularly, where the food where the industrial food system is so dominant um, that they influence policy, they influence, influence the kinds of research that are happening at the, at the public institutions. They're very, very powerful. Um, in New England, we don't have that kind of a powerful industrial uh, agricultural lobby. But we're able to do creative things. Uh, in much of the country where agriculture is a big economic interest, they influence things like what happens in classrooms uh, in, in the University of California, Davis. Um, I was working in Illinois up till when I leave, 1992. Um, I created an agroecology program at the University of Illinois 
in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, and uh, the dean that I worked for was invited. I was invited by the lieutenant governor to leave the state. He did not want me in the state because I was raising questions about using ecological principles to understand agricultural systems, and it caused great discomfort. The dean, to his credit, um, gave me a raise. He said, no, keep doing what you're doing. Um, but the state government, influenced by corporate lobbyists and the Farm Bureau, wanted me out of there. Uh, I eventually left because I wanted to come home to New England. Um, but there was a lot of political pressure not to do the kind of things that you get to do at University of Massachusetts because we don't have that political force, those, those industrial um, voices. Uh, California does. And so this is a really difficult thing to do in California. And yet, Fresno is trying to implement the vision as described by the Food Commons. I want to tell you about the Food Commons. Larry says, uh, he quotes, quotes Buckminster Fuller and says, uh, you never really change things by fighting the existing reality. Don't think of an elephant is not going to work. We've got to replace our mental models with a new vision of hope and responsibility. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. We can point out, hey, that's not working. Why don't we try this? Hey, the, you know, the, indu the industrial chicken products we buy here down in Stop and Shop are really cheap. Um, and the, input, the, the, the traps that come with that system are all part of the commodity system. Um, going up to Simple Gifts and buying chicken is an alternative model. He suggests that the food commons will have three components. These are the three components of the food commons. There will be a food trust, which I'll tell you about, a food hub, and a food bank. This food bank is not a food bank where you get food. This is a food bank where you get money, capital investments. These three have to all exist together. Currently, we're seeing around the country investments in food hubs, and I'll show you why. The food commons comes at this from a whole, much more holistic place, saying, you know what, the land is important, the food is important, and the money is important. And what we'll do is we'll shift all of these components by investing in the common good. The food commons bank would provide financial services to small lenders, to small, uh, uh, small producers, uh, and small consumers, and, or small um, retailers, uh, financial services, for which the return on investment did not go back to shareholders and corporate investments, but, but the turn, return on investment would reinvest in the community. When you lend money out, you can charge interest. You can make money for that, but that money then can be reinvested back in community rather than uh, going off to uh, Bank of America. The Food Commons hubs would aggregate and distribute food. We're seeing some of that around here. We're seeing small producers coming together that they, they can't get into big marketplaces because you don't produce enough carrots to get into a big marketplace on a regular basis. Uh, and so, and they can't pack often because they don't have a packing shed that'll handle the, the kind of product delivery system that they, they're required by the food stores. And so you aggregate. You bring things together, and you work together, and you ship together as an aggregate. Uh, aggregate and distribute through a food hub is something that's happening all around the country, particularly in areas where there are a lot of small farmers with, with, with some uh, economic viability. Now I'll show you what that looks like. The Food Commons Trusts would invest in helping people own farmland. In a place like Amherst, Massachusetts, where land is so expensive, it never comes on the marketplace for agricultural land, um, we need to figure out ways of, of acquiring that land uh, and keeping it in agriculture um, so that we have the infrastructure to produce food locally. Here's a food hub. The idea is that we take lots and lots of different kinds of food, we run it through a food hub, informed by the, com the commitment to the common good, informed by a trust and a bank, and then deli delivered out to places where they have demand. It can be done very, very efficiently. This is a food hub. Rather than one uh, cow producer selling to one restaurant over here, we're going through a food hub to improve efficiency. This is what our systems, our food systems looked like prior to World War II. Lots and lots of small producers dealing with lots and lots of small vendors, shops and restaurants. And it was very inefficient. It was very personal. Um, and there were a lot of small producers involved. Um, but it was relatively inefficient. Today, this is what our system looks like. looks like large producers and large supermarkets and institutions. Uh, very, very efficient. That is the result of the commodity, the commodity system. Very, very efficient. Low cost of food, lots of production, lots of food around, um, but not a lot of growers, not a lot of producers, not a lot of small, uh, small, small businesses. So what the Food Hub does, it addresses at least part of that problem. It suggests that we can keep a lot of small producers in business by aggregating a product and helping them ship together. So they can ship into UMass, they can ship um, to Stop and Shop, they can ship to the Big Y, they can ship to um, the big box stores. That's half of the solution. And that's not a bad idea. And we're seeing some of that around the country developing 
uh, because these small producers are coming together and you're cooperating and you're working together. It requires a commitment to cooperation. In 1975 or something like that, um, the, the, uh, there was a, a cooperative created in Western Massachusetts, um, out in uh, Hatfield. Anybody know the name of it? I can't remember the name of it. It was a food, a food co-op where they were going to come together, the small producers were going to come together and ship into Boston because they could then aggregate their food product, uh, run it through a hydrocooler, and put it in a box and send it to Boston. And what happened was they weren't desperate enough to actually make a full commitment. They didn't have contracts with each other that, that imagined a full commitment. What they did was they had excess product they sent down to the food co-op, and their best product they sent directly to consumers. So they're always sending their junk into the food hub. That won't work. There needs to be a commitment to something bigger than just sending in the excess product. This requires a commitment to the common good. Without that, this, this is uh, just more commodification. So the Food Commons suggested that a lot of people are at the table, that a lot of people can participate, and a lot of people will benefit. And the suggestion is that by not creating a single location where we, can, where we aggregate our product, but create a communication system that improves the connection between the small producers and the small shops. We can imagine a network, uh, a, a computer-driven network, that suggests that, oh, you've got this over here, I need this over here, to the transportation, the truck going your way, and let's make this happen. This is a, a, an idea um, a, of a different kind of a, uh, of a system, a network system, that the hub is not a physical place. It could be small physical, small physical places, but uh, it's basically a communications network that improves the connection. Because this person uh, in, uh, in Hatfield does not know um, this uh, grocery store in Holyoke. You know, and it's really difficult to know all the pop hustle of vendors. This communication hub developed by a, 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 a network communication system is an imagined, uh, is an imagined uh, a vision for the, uh, the food commons. But it's got to be held together by common values. If it's not a commitment to values, if there's not a mental model driving this, that becomes a structure that simply becomes commodified and people take advantage of over time. Uh, we've got to believe, make a commitment, a contractual commitment to common values. And so the, common, the, the food commons suggests that fairness and stewardship, economic opportunity, all the things that we associate with sustainability are part of this, this vision. Food sovereignty is a suggestion that we actually control our own destiny with respect to food. There's a town in Maine, which I'm not remembering the name of it, but they passed a local bylaw. It's called a food sovereignty bylaw. It suggests that all state and federal laws that contributed to the commodity system were no longer appropriate for our town. I can't think of the town's name. Which is completely illegal. You can't do that. Uh, but they did. They passed a local bylaw to make a point that suggests, you know, within our town boundaries, we have our own food sovereignty. We can control our own destiny. We can set our own prices, and we can make our own policies to disadvantage the global food system. Um, they'll be in the courts for years because local government doesn't have that kind of power. Um, but wouldn't it be neat if local government was able to create that kind of a, a infrastructure? Food sovereignty, uh, at least at a national level, suggests that we can control our own destiny. Integration of crops and livestock, transparency, so we know where our food's coming from, we know what it's costing, and we know what people are making on it. Ethics, accountability are all part of this vision that they're going to call the commons. We live in the commonwealth of Massachusetts. That commonwealth could include food if we believed it. And this system exists. It exists in Chinatown in New York City. In Chinatown in New York City, there's a lot, a lot of local vendors, a lot, a lot of product. They have a globalized, personal aggregation and distribution system. They know each other by phone calls and by, by, by who, you're, who you're married to. And this system actually has been documented in Chinatown in New York City. This was done by a professor from Cornell who wrote a book called From Farm to Canal Street. Canal Street is where Chinatown begins. Where I used to go down when I was a kid. I'd take the train in and buy firecrackers for Fourth of July, go to Canal Street. Um, I never paid attention to the produce, but there are lots and lots of produce markets. Uh, and this is uh, my Google Maps uh, of uh, some of the produce mac markets in, uh, in uh, Chinatown in New, York, in New York City. I want to read this to you. This was right out of the book. was mind-boggling. The way Chinatown produces food demonstrates another kind of globalization, one that does not threaten regional economies. It does not homogenize cultures. It is not controlled by big corporations. Chinatown's food system embodies a global economic network that is constructed by people 
who may have been marginalized, but instead are carving out their own, are carving out their own global niche in an economic network based on culture and biological um, specificities that people are involved in. People, they, this is a sense of place, a sense of who we are, a sense of culture, uh, and a personal sense of connections. This is, exists today. This is what used to exist all over the world uh, and has been homogenized and destroyed. So we take this communications network idea, and in Chinatown what they've done is they've put personal relationships in the place of a communications network. They still use phone systems, they still use email, they still use text messages, um, but it's based on a common values because people know each other. That system is a food commons. It's the best example of a food commons I can find. Uh, it exists today, suggesting that it's not impossible. The food commons uh, would connect you know, regional small producers <laughs> in the South with small uh, vendors in the South, with small vendors in, in the Northwest, with each other. This is not, a, this is not an isolationist strategy. This is a globalization by networking, maintaining the smallness of individual producers and maintaining strong sense of community, either through a communications network, which could not have happened 20 years ago, but today we have the technology to do, or a personal network that exists today among some cultures. This is a viable possibility. This has been proposed um, by Larry and his friends in California and has been, has been taken up as a founding principle by the city of Fresno and how they think about the environment and the food systems. The food commons includes food land trusts, uh, food distribution, and food investment. And we, if, you look at, if you look at the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts and say, and you go home at Thanksgiving and you tell your family about it, the response, for at least Rob, is Rob here, the response from your family is going to see that's crazy, right? So here we have using the upside down iceberg uh, for you, Rob. Okay, we're going to suggest in the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts something is possible. Well, did you know that there's already a food a, a land trust in the Pioneer? There's several land trusts actually. The one I'm involved with is called the North Amherst Community Farm. The North Amherst Community Farm came together about seven or eight years ago and found out that the farm that Simple Gifts was being the, the land that Simple Gifts was being farmed on is, is, is farming on now was up for sale. And the developer offered the family a million six. Um, a land trust was formed, a nonprofit land trust was formed called the North Amherst Community Farm. We bought that land for a million three. We got all sorts of donations, lots and lots of people. Uh, we bought that land and we created a, uh, a long-term contract for Simple Gifts Farm, which is a commercial for-profit business on um, public lands, publicly owned trust lands. This is happening all throughout the country. When you can't afford the farm in Amherst, you have two choices. One is not farming in Amherst any longer, and not having that, that local connection, uh, or doing something about it, and a land trust is another way of, of uh, approaching that. Uh, those of you who've been up to Seed Solidarity, Deb and Rick uh, bought that land from a land trust, and I forget the name of it, um, but it was relatively inexpensive land. They didn't have any money, and so they got help from a land trust who, who helped them buy that property. This is an example of a food commons trust. Yesterday morning's paper, I'm going through the paper, and I'm reading about the Common Good Bank. Um, in Greenfield. I'm a member of the Common Good Bank. I don't actually use it because their credit card is actually mostly good up in Greenfield. But this is a bank uh, in Greenfield, Massachusetts that will take investors and create credit cards and you can use that credit card to buy things at certain establishments in, in Western Massachusetts. You can borrow money from that bank um, and the, the return on investment, the interest that comes back is then invested back in the community not just in food, but in small local businesses in Greenfield, Massachusetts. This is yesterday's paper talking about the Common Good Bank. It's an example of a food, not just simply food, but a commons bank. The, uh, Berkshire's uh, dollars uh, is a, another example in Western Massachusetts. Uh, there are um, local dollars that you can use to reinvest in local, in local businesses. Um, we're seeing this appearing around the country. And a food hub. Uh, anyone been, been down to Joe Zykowski's place in Hadley here? Or Wally Zykowski's um, Plainfield Farm? So, um, within sight of this building, <laughs> if you can see it through the other buildings, uh, Joe um, is about a third generation Polish family. The Polish families came into Western Massachusetts. It was a, it was a, revol it was a revolution, a revolt in Poland uh, in 1905, I believe, and a, then a reestablishment of a monarchy, uh, a very oppressive. Uh, government and many people left. 
many of the Polish people, the farmers, came into Western Massachusetts and worked as farm workers around 1900. Um, by the 20s and the 30s, they had saved enough money to start buying land from the original, original English settlers uh, and shifted the food culture um, based on a common culture and common heritage. The families in Western and down in Hadley, um, land never comes up for rent because if you're if, if, you're, if you have land, I have land, and I've grown tomatoes and you've grown wheat, uh, next year it makes a whole lot of sense for us to, to just trade, you know? And sometimes by contract, sometimes, sometimes by handshakes, uh, people will just trade, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 acres because they know the families that live down the street because they're neighbors and have been part of the same heritage for a long, long time. Joe has done something really creative. He created Lakeside Organics, but he also has his Joe Sikowski farm. He grows both organic and non-organic. Um, and what he'll do is he'll aggregate for small growers. He's got a big packing shed. Um, he was lucky enough, he and his brother Wally uh, were lucky enough, their father had uh, enough land. Both sons created businesses, both created big packing sheds, shipping to the big Y. And, um, and they are, uh, they're major shippers. They, they have a big market uh, at UMass. Uh, we buy a lot of their product. But they also buy from small producers. They buy from a lot of small producers. They aggregate their product. So somebody who's growing a couple acres of carrots can actually sell a couple of acres of carrots of the product to Joe, who put them in boxes, make them look like <laughs> all the other carrots, because they've got to look the same in a box when they go to the major food channels and ship it over to UMass. When, um, when he started doing this, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, people were confused. Why would you bother doing something for your neighbors? Why would you bother helping your neighbors out? Why don't you just buy their land and put them out of business? And it came from a cultural, uh, a culture of sharing and working with each other. Um, that, that wasn't part of their mental models. That, 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 the, the, uh, the dominant English culture in New England was very cutthroat. Um, the Polish culture as it came into this country in the early part of the 20th century uh, had different core values. And, and those core values are evident today if you know some of these farm families um, in, in Hadley. He helped his neighbors out. He helped himself out. He's got a packing chain. He's got to keep it busy. Uh, and so he brings in product from other people and repacks it for small producers and sells it to, to UMass. And he sells a lot of product to UMass. So that's a food hub. It's not the distribution part of the food hub. It's the aggregation part of the food hub. And it's a, it's a partial step. Each of these examples contributes to what I would call the foods commons here in Western Massachusetts with these understandings that these, these things are happening. We can choose to participate in, in the great turning. Uh, we could choose to ignore it. You know, My invitation is choose to participate. We've gone from chickens crossing the roads. We're understanding a commodif commodification system. It is killing us and killing our planet. We've got suggestions or other ways to work. We've got examples all based on different mental models. If we don't adopt the mental models, if we don't see ourselves as part of something bigger than ourselves, none of this makes any sense. Thank you for your attention.